are some things I have to face Concerning me and you I have to say face Because you're with someone new I can feel it in the air Telepathy Does it hurt that I don't care Or don't you think about me Welcome to the Voodoo Podcast, you savages. Today's guest is the beautiful Julia Messenger. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Direct from Germany. Um, I noticed you've got some NS10s at the back there. Yes, are they, I do. Are, are they original NS10s? They are. Gee. Yeah, I've had those for years. They're oh, great. Yeah, they're good. You've got some too. I do. Yeah, yeah, they're really good for um, getting a really honest mix. They're they really, are. I use my um, Dyne Audios for, for, for fun and to get what I the sound I really want to hear. Yeah. Um, and then just to check everything, I go to the NS10s, just check uh. nothing sticking out. Yeah. <laughs> like a so, sore so, thumb. So you, you yeah. do all your recording, you do all your production, you do it all, right? You don't have... Yes. You don't get an expert like me in and uh, help you out at all? No. No? No, I don't. You don't need it. Yeah. I'd love to. I'd love to not not do all of that yeah. and get experts in, but it costs money. It does. Um, and, and I just want to create, you know. Yeah. So um, when you just want to create in life, that's a lovely, luxurious situation to be in, but you don't make a lot of money to, uh, to yeah. pay people like yourself to come in, yeah. you know. So, yeah. I mean, how did, how did – I mean, that would be weird because you – you're going to have to worry about the technical side of it. Then you have to sing or you play the piano or you'll play the guitar, whatever it is you're going to be doing. Does that take you away from the creative process sometimes when you're going into that technical side as well? You lose the moment sort of thing, you know? It does really that... does. On the other side, though, it can actually enhance it. On the other side, it actually can inspire what you want to say. Um, but... When you just want to sing something and you can't get the right vocal sound for that particular track, uh, it can get really, really frustrating. Um, but, you know, I'm a lot better at it than I used to be. Um, it used to be, I mean, I used to just set up the mic and just leave it that way and now I don't necessarily do that because I think different sounds for different tracks is really um, important. But, um, yeah, gen- generally... It's not the setup's not too hard. The way I've got it is actually not too difficult. But mm. um, yeah, as I say, sometimes it can be a real hindrance, and you just go, "Oh, I just want to work. I just want to create," and you can't do it because you've got to get all the electronics right. But then you can find mistakes in the electronics too. So sometimes it can be good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've got an upright. You've got a. Have you got a small baby grand as well? Is that right? Have you got both of those pianos in the Yeah, I have. Yeah, the, the upright is just a childhood thing that I can't let go of that I don't well, that, really use, but it's actually a really good piano. <laughs> that, well, that's okay. I mean, how long have you had the upright for? Uh, the upright, oh, um, probably since I was eight. Yeah, something like wow, that. Well, you've had it that long. That's pretty much seen your career, your whole career. Yeah. Yeah, it I've started. Some songs it started that with that, that piano, and it's yeah, yeah. So you're currently in your Milk Bar Studios. I am. So yes. you've created a number of CDs out of that studio, haven't you? I have. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so, so the one that you, I, I'm, I'm a bit intrigued because you recorded a live CD from Bennett's Lane, and um, did you mix it at your studio? Yes, yes. So I mixed and mastered it here. Oh, wow. Yeah. It sounds pretty good because I was listening to it. It sounds really good. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So I didn't realise what I was up for, but um, I heard later that mixing a live album is much more difficult than, than mixing a, a non-live album. So I, if I had have known that when I went into it, I might not have um, embarked upon it. But, um, but I'm glad I did. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I, I didn't know half what I know now about mixing. So I'm actually, I don't know how I blindly, I just blindly listened and, and um, you know, that's how, I, that's how I went through that. I didn't actually have the technicals behind me then, which I do now. So, um, yeah, interesting anyway. I'm glad it sounds all right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, did you have Mark Fitzgibbon on piano for that or? Yeah, yeah, Mark Fitzgibbon yeah. on piano. Okay. Yeah. And how did you record? Um, how did you record it? Was it did you did someone come in and do all the multi? Or was that the ABC that gave you the stems? No, no, no. Um, nothing to do with the ABC. Um, okay. It was I just did it myself. Well, Bennett's Lane. I think I was there like I don't know once every two weeks. I had a gig there, um, and they were like, "People want to see DJ Julia," and they kept saying it. And I was like, "Okay, well." Um, and I think Jeremy, who managed um, Bennett's Lane at the time, said, how about we record something here? So, um, yeah, so I called someone through someone who came and recorded all the tracks yeah. um, and I requested, you know, perhaps four drum mics and, you know, a um, couple of piano mics, etc. And then I just went home with it and mixed it and mastered it and released it. So it was that sort of simple. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, and it worked out well. Yeah, nice and cheap. <laughs> Did it all myself. <laughs> I mean, and but that would work well for you because obviously when you do live shows, there's you've got a product of a live show that you can then sell for ten bucks or whatever it is. You know, it's a yeah, handy little thing they have, quite isn't a bit it? Of money from it, and I yeah. did three pressings, so well, it wasn't it wasn't bad actually. It was good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a yeah. it's a great way to do things. I reckon you know for for, yeah. pe- 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 for performers anyway. You know, yeah. yeah, but um, yeah, now um, people don't want CDs anymore. No, they don't. No. I don't, so I, I noticed that my last recital centre um, gig, unless everyone's already got all my CDs, um, the how much I normally make from CDs dropped dramatically. So um, I was thinking, hmm, what do we do now? It's just all online. It's just all Spotify. I, I don't even know if my jazz album's on Spotify. Um, I don't actually look at Spotify, but it probably is. Maybe, maybe they... <laughs> Maybe they listen to Spotify. The old, the old people who listen to my jazz gigs. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, who knows, eh? <laughs> they oh, probably rec- do actually. My dad's really savvy with that stuff, so they probably do. <laughs> Your dad's savvy. Yeah, my dad's really computer savvy. Is he? So he probably does. In fact, yeah, he showed me. He just had a Google my name. He just says, "I just say, hey Google, play Julia Messenger," <laughs> and he gets a mixture. Wow, so. <laughs> it's a it's a deep. Um, seeded thing, isn't it? The old uh, streaming um, for musicians, especially uh, to try and make a living from it. Uh, royalty wise, there's just nothing there. I mean, I don't even know what you get if you get played on Spotify. I think it's like you net over a million plays or something to get any. I think it's point zero two cent, zero zero two or zero two cents a play but, or something. Um, you know, the weird thing is, I actually have been making money since things have gone online, and I think that is because there is actually data. And um, the computer systems somehow have the algorithm the algorithms to work everything out, whereas APRA didn't quite do that very well for me. But but since everything's really logged, um, you know, with Pand- across the board from Pandora to Spotify to YouTube, I'm actually getting some good money. So okay. yeah, so it actually sort of works for me, even though it's not much. You know, in the scheme of life, it's not much. Yeah. Um, yeah, my money is starting to really get collected now. Where I, you know, was once I was banging on the door saying, um, I, "Why haven't I been?" getting any money for this um <laughs> now it's like see it is being played <laughs> i can see it it's two cents <laughs> yeah. that's a lot of plays two cents <laughs> yeah absolutely and it's quite exciting when you get that check yeah no i, you know, I, I know I, yeah I, I i mean i get checks from america and sound a sound exchange it's called and stuff like mm-hmm. that so oh great yeah i just want to take you back a little bit you you, you actually left you were saying earlier you left Australia to go to Germany um was that because of uh creative reasons and if so what were you doing electronics you you were d- delving into electronic music you went from yeah ca- I went from of, being with Ruby Fruit Jungle yeah. who I don't know if you remember Ruby Fruit Jungle we were an all-female band we did we were very percussive based I played congas and djembe and sang um and percussion um and You know, whilst I loved that, there were five other creative people who wanted to have their say and that's all great. But at the time I knew that I wanted to do my own stuff as well. And um, we toured Germany. That's how I first came into contact with Germany. And then on that tour I actually met some producers who 
during that tour, I actually recorded some solo tracks and some of my own tracks with those producers. And um, that's that what that just fed me. I was just like, this is what I've got to do. So um, yeah, so that's sort of what first um, took me took me to Germany is just being able to express myself as a solo artist rather than um, and and actually you know yeah not have to contend with with what other with five other people and their own opinions of where the direction we should go in because I was pretty clear on the direction I wanted to go in myself um, and so I was able to do that in Germany and um, yeah and then I then I started working with a lot of different people there as a um, uh, you know, as a guest artist. So I'd work with different producers and I'd just become the guest singer or do, um, you know, guest spots. Um, and, yeah, that was great too. So, yeah, it was, all, it was all really fun. A lot of beautiful music with great people in great studios. I was actually really spoiled, worked with some of the best artists in the world, really. I was <laughs> just landed a really good, uh, good little niche for myself there. So that was great, yeah. So did you, how did you end up in Germany did, we, did you uh, meet a uh, promoter who was from there originally who said he saw your band and said, look, come up, come over to Germany and perform? Was that how? Exactly. It, yeah. yeah. So okay. that's how it worked. So basically the promoter came to the Evelyn, yeah. uh, saw us playing at the Evelyn and asked us to do a tour in Germany for three months. Wow. So that's what we, yeah, it was very lucky, really was that, great. Was that just yeah. a random fate of events that occurred? Was he just there ba- not, not to see you specifically? He just sort of went in there to see what was happening and he saw you and he said, oh, this is great, I'm going to take them back to Germany and promote them. Is that, was that um, the No, point? he had heard about us. He had okay. come right. to, to come and check us out okay. and see, yeah. There was, there so it was a the, pre-calculated thing. There was no internet back then, right? No. There's no. nothing even there a Ruby Fruit Jungle on yeah. the internet. Wow. <laughs> Did you record at all? Um, yeah, we've recorded two albums. Yeah. <laughs> what are you laughing at? <laughs> um, uh, well, that's great. Uh, and uh, what year did you record those CDs? Ooh, 99. Nineteen ninety nine. Nineteen ninety seven. And okay. 99. Okay. Yeah. Now, I remember yeah. because in 1997, your engineer came to Woodstock and he was a hippie. Oh, Tim. Tim. Yeah, I remember he came to Woodstock because he was living out in uh, somewhere Blackwood. out. Blackwood. Was it Blackwood yeah. he was living at that stage? Blackwood. And, uh, and I, he, you know, he uh, had the hippie pants and stuff and, he's, and, he, and I showed him around the studio and he said, oh, yeah, look, I don't think this studio is going to work for the band that I'm working with. It's just because it's not big enough, you know, we need a bigger space. And I, you need I'd, a space for a lot of big egos. <laughs> is, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I, I actually thought I had him. I thought I'm going to, I sold him the deal, you know. But um, and then I ended up uh, taking his spot at Circus Eyes about five years, six years later. Yeah, right. So right. Um, that's my relationship. It's weird how people come in your life like that. You know, you meet them once, you have an impression of them. You just go, "This guy's a bit of a hippie." I think he actually had a dog in the side of his car, and yeah. You know, yeah. and he had all the. Th- now he's a brilliant guy, Tim Cole. Yeah, he um he was part. He was the sound. He was part of the sound. Um, you know, behind the sound of not drowning and wa- not drowning waving. Remember okay. that band? Yeah. yeah, yeah, beautiful. I loved not drowning waving and, yeah. and the, the the beautiful soundscapes. And that was all Tim. So okay. Tim um Tim Cole, yeah, he he insisted on being the seventh member of our band. So he wasn't just the engineer and the mixer. He was part of the band and that's mm-hmm. the deal. That's what it was. And, okay. yeah, it was great. Having him was amazing. So was luxurious. He, he, he was, was he touring with Circus Size at that stage? No, that started no? later. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Mm. Well, there you go. It's a small world, isn't it? Yes, it is. We could yeah. have met. We could have met in 1997. Well, I think we did. Did we? I remember you then. No. I remember your long hair. No. You don't remember meeting them? No. No. Through my no. sisters. I'm pretty sure through Genevieve. No, I don't think so. I think that was later. I think because uh, you came and sung on one of my one of the songs that I uh, put together and that's that was the first when time. When was that? That would have been when you got back from Germany. That would have been 2003 or something. Yeah, but I knew you before then. No, I don't Do think so. You not know that, Pete? No. I, I, Pete, I've known you for like 10 years before that moment. Are you serious? I thought you asked me because you knew who I was. 
No. <laughs> you what, no. you just heard about my voice. What? I just heard about your voice, yeah, because I said I need a girl singer and someone, I don't, someone, because you know how people say you should try this person because I was looking for somebody. Right. And, uh, and, and I wanted someone who could, it's hard when, when you've got a male vocalist, you know, who's, who's, who's a singer-songwriter because I was doing some cover songs. I don't know if you remember the song. It was called Father On. And, oh yeah, and, I do actually. And um, coming back to me, yeah. And anyway, you came to Woodstock. You, you sung the song, but it was—it's a hard song because it's—it's lyrically, it's heavily lyrically based, and it's a piano-driven song. And I'm trying to do it with cellos and acoustic guitar. And it—and it was real. And listening back to it, because sometimes I do listen back to it, um, and I just—and I think it would have been better executed if I actually had Mark Fitzgibbon play piano and try to replicate it from the bass of a piano rather than an acoustic guitar. Because right. I think sometimes you sort of, you can't mess with it. With, when something works, and I, don't, I think you just got to stay with what works and then give it its own voice, you know, some way yeah. uh, with, yeah. with, with the voice, you know. Yeah, that's all awesome. Um, Can you a, send it, it to me? I'd like to have a listen. Yeah, I will. Awesome. I can, uh, you know. Yeah, but I knew you already because, you know, you know my sister Genevieve. I, yes, of course. You know Tash. No, I haven't met Tash before. Do, do you remember seeing us in the Messenger Sisters? No. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure I know you from before <laughs> 2003. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to verify that with my sister and get back to you. Okay. Here we can. <laughs> I mean, she's she's living in Blackwood now, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. So Tim Cole, yeah, and her know each other from Blackwood as well. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I think yeah, Genevieve went to university with David Bridey, who was in Not Drowning Waving. Oh, it's right. all a small world. It is. Yeah. Is he is he the same age as Genevieve? Must be. Yeah. Wow. Mm. I thought he was a lot older than that. Well, I don't know how old he is. Yeah. Maybe he was older. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. So Maybe he went he to the. <laughs> she it? probably heard me to say that. Oh yeah, he taught her. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're having a bit of grief in Blackwood at the moment. Do you know that with the uh, chopping down the trees and doing yeah. something? Yeah. Yeah. What's I saw going? That what's, in the news. what's going on there? Do you know? Or? No, they're just starting to drill, do some drilling there, and they haven't um, <clears throat> asked any of the residents if that's okay, and. They're, um, they're supposed to ask the residents, apparently, um, but there's loopholes. So maybe they're, they're just being silent. The mining is, they're trying to do some mining there, which is ludicrous. It's just like 40 minutes up the road. Yeah. Um, they must be desperate to find mining spots. Yeah. I, mean, what I think they... there's good gold there. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what else has been happening? Tell me what, you, what are you doing with your, with, your, with your music? What's going on? Well, I, I just sent you that thing. I just did um, the isolation CD yes, in the you UK. Did. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, I totally forgot about that because it happened at the beginning of the pandemic that I got contacted by this guy named Mark Jenkins, who's um, an electronic music producer and quite well known in the UK. He's been around for years. And um, he asked me to collaborate on a CD. It's called Isolation which has just been released actually, and it's from electronic music artists all around the world and I'm the Australian representative for it. So um, there's, um, you know, the guys, there's, there's Austria, Holland, Germany, USA, UK, Australia, and I think that's it, Switzerland maybe. Um, yeah, so guys from Tangerine Dream, I think he was asking someone from Ultravox, um, he is from the UK and, yeah, some other people that I'm, I'm, not, I mean, I'm not really sure on who they are exactly but they're all supposed to be in that, you know, big in that electronic music scene. And um, so I, I actually didn't do anything um, production-wise. I just um, recorded the vocals, recorded vocals and, you know, ethereal type stuff over what I was given. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, it's all finished now. So I haven't actually got a copy so I can't comment on it but... Um, uh, yeah, they're sending me a copy in the mail. So, yeah, but it's, but it has been released, and that yeah. So and it's and it's the the money is for charity, charity to yeah. give money to NHS um, care workers. Yeah, <clears throat> great. That's a good cause. Yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to hearing it. Yeah, so there are big some big names on it. You mm. know. Yeah. yeah. 
Totally. Did you used to catch a train from Brunswick to North Altona? Um, what did I used to do? Yeah, I must have done something like that. I remember trams and trains and, yeah, I did mm. a lot of travelling to get to schools because we moved a lot or we moved a lot when I was a kid. Mm. So, um, and every time, we, when, I got, when I got old enough, I would say I'm not leaving schools and then I'd have to catch trams and trains and, you know, it would be actually quite an ordeal to get to school sometimes. Mm. Um, but, yeah, that's why when I grew up I just wanted my own house. I didn't want to move again. I just yeah. didn't, yeah. <laughs> I'm not You're moving. I'm buying my own house. I'm not moving. <laughs> well, I know, I'm traumatized. I, I, I got a yeah. little bit of that because when I um, I left Willie Tech and and then I got accepted into Maribyrnong High School, and they had a music course. They had a what they used to call a uh, Year Eleven uh, STC, which was a um, you could pick your own electives based on what your interests were. Mm. And it was great because I thought, fantastic! I'm going to be able to do music, and uh, and I and I had to catch a bus from North Altona to Newport Station, catch the train to Footscray, and then catch a tram to Maribyrnong. <laughs> it was just and just getting to school. I remember because I used to just walk around the corner basically and go to school for many years, and then you know I'm current, and then I'm all of a sudden have to get. Get up out of bed earlier, get organised, and catch all these transports. So by the time I used to get to school, the only good thing I used to really like about it was the Olympic Donut guy um, at Footscray Station. Exactly, I was about to say that the best thing was getting the donuts at Footscray. Like, who cares? I got my donuts at Footscray. They were the best donuts in the world. They were, and um, <laughs> yeah, they, they, they. I think they only just stopped five years ago, but like, you're right. They were there for years. Yeah, yeah I think. I think the sun took over and then the sun let it go. Like that's how long it had been there for. Wow. Um, but, yeah, so I, I went to primary school and I had to go via Footscray Station and I went to high school and had to go via Footscray Station. So, yeah, um, those donuts, the, in that white bag you get the five donuts, oh, yeah. like the, the hot jam. And, yeah. yeah. Man, I used to buy Nothing them. Nothing like it. It was incredible. <laughs> Nothing like it. F- Footscray always had a very um, – it was a weird place, especially around that area because you had the bowling alley. Do you remember the bowling alley? They used to have down on the... I didn't really go there with family okay. or anything. I was just there by myself. Yeah. I was even doing it in grade six. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. I think occasionally I remember my sister being with me, but we didn't... It wasn't an outing to go to Footscray. It was just a, a through thing. Through thing, yeah. That, the yeah, donuts. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, so we... I don't remember hanging out in Footscray. Okay. Yeah. Well, with me, I, yeah. I, I uh, used to... I used to, occasionally used to go to the bowling alley, and then you would get the chicken and chips. Go to the bowling alley and play, uh-huh. and and there used to be a uh, and they had a great um, pinball parlor. That was the other thing they had. Great, it was no. like I remember that pinball yeah. parlor because I won a ghetto blaster. Oh really? A pinball parlor <laughs> because my sister was into yo yo. Oh so, right. There was a girls' yo-yo competition, yeah, right. and we went. We the whole family went to support Tash in the yo-yo competition. But there was, I don't think there were any other girls. Like there was a boys' competition and a girls, and there weren't any other girls. So I went in the yo-yo competition, and so did Genevieve. <laughs> and you won a ghetto we, blaster. I think I came second, and Jen came third, and Tash, of course, came first. So did she have the Coke one or the Fanta one? Oh, I think she had them all. She had them yeah, all. Yeah, she had them all. Even yeah, the, yeah, but that, that was at that, that Footscray, that Footscray, that pinball Footscray pinball place. Parlor. And she, who won the Ghetto Blaster? Maybe I won a Sony Walkman or something. Like oh, I won something good, pretty cool. That's a great yeah, prize. Yeah, great prizes. Yeah. <laughs> Go Tash. Yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, that's, that's so they're great stories because um, the, the thing that I noticed about it was uh, I had been hanging out at Borick Square. I don't know if you know Borick Square at all. Um, in North no. Altona. Uh, anyway, it's where all the shops are. And they used to have a, an Italian coffee shop which used to have half a dozen pinball machines. They had Space Invaders and a couple of other things. And uh, they had a money machine. And all and they had gambling t- tables that all the Italian men used to play cards on, you know. And so that was, yeah. that, that was the extent. And then they opened up another pinball parlour just uh, – which was a lot bigger – uh, which was all the rage for about a year and a half, but they never upgraded their machines. And so when I went into, when I was coming back from Maribyrnong High, I just dropped into that pinball parlor just to see if they had what type of machines they had. Mate, they had 
rows and rows of different types of machines and it was just like wow this is great this is like this is wow. a, this is an upgrade from where i'm from you know what i mean this is like going to time zone in the city because that was the other place we used to go to you know to play yeah. pinball machines because that was a big thing when i was growing up was pinball machines and yeah um space yeah. invaders and all that i spent a lot of i spent a lot of time and wasted a lot of money during that time space invaders oh man yeah, yeah, so did my, my sister was really good at Space Invaders, Tash, yeah. Really? Into the yo-yos, into the Space Invaders. Yeah, she used to sit there all the time and go, bah, wah. <laughs> <laughs> she was really good. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that uh, Space Invaders used to do my head in because I'd get to a certain point and I could just never pass that point. Right. You know what right. I mean? No matter never, how many 20 never, senses. You never took the high score. Nah, no, I was far from it, man. <laughs> I, I'd be, you know, I think maybe. Tash did. I think she was pretty good at it. Yeah. I probably saw her name typed in at one of the Probably. Part, probably, <laughs> you know. <laughs> You've done a lot of world music, yeah? I guess so. Yeah. yeah. What what was that because of what made you get into world music? Well, the stuff I did with Klaus Schulze, which, you know, he was the guy from Tangerine Dream. Um, how how did you ma- how, how did you meet that, him? That was very worldy. The stuff I did with Scott Rockenfield from Queensryche, that's very filmic and worldy. Okay. You know, um, I tap into other voices, not just the Australian cultural voice. You know, I, I, I get influenced by Middle Eastern things and, um, you know, other other ideas or things that I've heard. Um, I recreate languages when I write tunes. So with uh, the, the Queens, uh, Scott Rockenfield, I, um, I wrote my own languages and sang on his film with my own tongue, <laughs> which I guess sounds very worldy. Um, and just, cre- you know, just exploring the space that the music um, speaks to me with, uh, with the voice, you know, exploring space with voice. So not being constrained by a verse, melody and a chorus. I guess that's probably what I'm, you know, what, what I would call world music as well. It's not constrained by Western um, structure. So um, there is structure but it's, um, it's in a different form. So, yeah, and melodically as well, the scales are different. So, yeah, just trying to feel what the music's saying and take it to a place that's a bit, um, a bit more spiritual than something perhaps I would normally sing. Yeah. Well, not more spiritual because all singing is sort of spiritual, but um, in a space that I'm not even aware of, I'm going to. I don't know, I don't know where I'm going to go either when I'm, when I'm singing. And that's sort of what I just did with this um, isolation CD too. That's what they wanted from me. I knew it and uh, they wanted me to do that sort of sa- same soundscape stuff that I was doing with Klaus Schultz so where I just listen to what they've created and try and complement it with, with a vocal that will take you perhaps a little bit deeper into that idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because I worked with a... Um... <clears throat> can't remember what her name was. Um, she was doing a film score and they asked me to record it and, that, and they used voices, um, har- harmony voices to do um, s- sort of that style you're talking about. And they, had, and they brought in a guy who um, played classical guitar and he was really good at playing classical guitar so they sort of blended their voices with his guitar playing and um, just got to remember, Jacques, do you know some, some, some woman called Jacques? Jenny oh, Jacques? Or Judy something. Jacques. Judy Jacques, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the uh, yeah. jazz singer. Yeah, it was yeah, her. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah, it was her. And um, I never knew what happened to that, but I remember uh, mixing it for him and I thought, geez, this sounds bloody awesome, you know. Like, oh, what Judy you- Jacques, she's, she's got lovely, lovely ideas and lovely mm. music, yeah. Um, I was listening to one of her CDs recently, actually. Um, I used to go and see her years ago. Um, yeah, she's one of those Melbourne people who is very brilliant, but there hasn't been a big platform for her, yeah. unfortunately. But she's got beautiful ideas and she's been very respected in her area and mm. her field. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, well, there yeah, you go. And that's, that's yeah, it's, it's, it's exploring space. It's yeah. not necessarily... Um, in your face. Yeah. It's no, more, no, it's beautiful. It's more taking a background and just yeah. listening. No, it's beautiful. And, and contributing that way. Yeah. I, I uh, when I worked with her, we did about three, two days in the studio and uh, 
I remember uh, sort of going, this is where I'd love to do this sort of stuff all the time, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah. In, in Melbourne, Me too. you know, you know what I mean? In Melbourne, you just go, you're a bit stuck because there's, it's not like, yeah. you know, you, in America, you kick a t- can and you'll find 20 people just pop out of the can, you know. Who yeah. do that sort of thing? You know what I mean. There's there's an industry for it, but in Melbourne, it was like scratching. Where do you start from? You know. Yeah, that. Yeah, unfortunately, there's not like that's what I miss about living in Germany is the brilliance of the musicians and the time that we have or had to create something beautiful um and the the quality of the studios the quality of the the engineers the amount of people who want to try and do something different it doesn't sort of exist as much i've found here mm. the the you know the the amount of people that are that are brilliant but want to do something different yeah. lots of brilliant people here i mean do a lot of the same yeah you know <laughs> so it gets very stale and it gets hard to be inspired mm. really hard yeah um so you've got to find the inspiration yourself somehow And sometimes I just try and tap into the world where I am in those places with those people that really inspire me and also encourage me and respect me and bring out what I want to say with them. And I just have to sort of pretend I'm sort of with them sometimes because they're not here physically, Mm. you know, and and it's um, when they're not here physically with you, it yeah, you feel a bit limited by, you know, you get, yeah, by what you have to do with, with, with you know, and, and, and people are limited because, because you know, they want to get paid. A lot of, yeah. a lot of you know, you, you know, you have to do, you have to do some mainstream stuff to get paid around here. So I mm. guess that's why as well. People yeah, totally. Do very similar stuff. Yeah. Well, good to chat, Pete. Yeah, likewise. I'll keep in contact with you. Yeah, please All right. do. All right, mate. You must have cast a spell.